Welcome Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders to our Explore the Bible overview of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 12 for April the 3rd, 2022 with the title of Demonstrated. One way you could open this lesson would be to ask your group to share what are some Christian terms that a lost person or maybe a new Christian might find difficult to understand. Well, there's a whole lot of them, aren't there? I mean, repentance or salvation or blood of the lamb or eschatology. There's a whole bunch. You can think of a lot. Your class members will be able to think of a lot of them. And after you've uh, talked about that for a while, then you can say this morning, we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which uh, brings forward one of those uh, terms that a lot of people find difficult, which is sanctification. A big 25 cent word, but it's a vital priority in the Christian life. Last week, we ended our study of 1 Thessalonians 3 with Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians in, in chapter 3, verse 12, that God would establish them in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus. Those, those last words of chapter 3 serve as kind of an outline for what's coming in chapter 4, which basically deals with two things, the life of holiness that Paul prays for them and the coming of the Lord Jesus. So this week, we're going to look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, the life of holiness, or as we'll see, it's called sanctification. And then next week, at 4.13 to 18, and the return of the Lord. So let's look first at the life of holiness or sanctification in chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Now, several of you had asked me about the Bulgaria trip. I'm going to give a brief report on that at the end of the video. If you're interested in that, you can listen to it. If you're not, you can just end it right there. So that'll hopefully be a help to those of you who want to hear from that. But looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 here, verses 1 through 12, he says in verse 1, you receive from us instruction as how you ought to walk and please God. So this section is going to be on walking in a manner that pleases God. In other words, on a holy life. And then notice two ways he qualifies this. He says, number one, just as you actually do walk, he says, uh, you're already doing this. He, he, he had already said in chapter one, he said, you turn from God to idols to serve a, a living and true God. He, he talked about how their lives were changed so that they were doing this already. But then he says here in verse 2, I want you to excel still more. So he says, you're doing it, but I want you to do it even more, which reminds us we are never to be content with where we are spiritually. And especially as he begins talking here about our growth in holiness, we're never to be content. There's a, there's a real tension here. There's a key tension here. We are never going to be perfect in holiness as long as we live here on this earth. First John says, if any man says he has no sin, uh, present tense uh, verb, if anyone says he presently has no sin, he lies and he doesn't practice the truth. We all have sin and we will, uh, to the last day we live here on earth, we will never be perfect. Uh, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, that's balanced by the desire we'd have to continue to grow in holiness as long as we live. See, some have the attitude, well, I'll never be perfect, so I'm not going to worry about it. No, that's not the attitude we're to have as God's people. We are always to be striving to be more holy. One of my favorite verses regarding holiness is 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the sight of God. He says, push on towards holiness. Be perfecting your holiness. We're never going to be perfect as long as we live, but we're not to be content where we are. We're to keep pushing forwards towards more holiness in our lives continually. In one of the Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, between Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas, Abraham Lincoln asked his listeners, why does the Declaration of Independence assert that all men are created equal? He said it's not because they believe that uh, all men had actually attained equality, uh, Lincoln said. He said that that's an obvious untruth. We're, we're not all being uh, treated equal. He said the founder's point was that equality for all was a goal that should be constantly looked to, constantly labored for, even though never perfectly attained in this union. He said we're never going to get it perfect. He said, but let's keep pushing for equality, pushing for that all men would, would uh, be treated equally. And see, he says, we're never going to get it, but keep pushing toward it. And that's exactly how it is with holiness. We, we never achieve it perfectly here on earth, but we're not supposed to settle for where we are. We're to continually strive towards being more holy. So that, that's the tension here. And I, I think it's important for you to communicate that with your group. You're never going to be perfect as long as you live here on earth, 
but we're always to be striving to be more holy as long as we live. Never think you're perfect, but never stop trying. Then the, the, the verse two tells the authority for that. Why should we be holy? He says, we know we, we gave you this command by the authority of the Lord Jesus. He says, we're not making up this command to be holy. The Lord gave it to us. It, it's imperative for us as Christians. Then beginning in verse three, he begins to talk about uh, sanctification. He says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. God's will is for you to be holy. He wants you to be holy. And the, the word sanctification, this is a key. The word sanctification is used three times in this passage. Verse three, verse four, verse seven. Whenever you see something repeated like that, a word or a term or phrase repeated in a passage, you know God is really emphasizing it. So that the kind of life, God's will for us. A lot of us think of God's will as who, what person should I marry or what job should I have? God says, my will for you is to be holy. My will for you is sanctification. The word sanctification is that big old 25 cent word, but it means to, to be set apart. It means to be making holy, to be made holy in your life. Now, you might take some time in your class to touch on the differences in the terms justification, sanctification, and glorification. Many of you are familiar with that. Uh, we, we were saved from the guilt of sin when we're justified in, in justification. We are being gradually saved from, from the power of sin in sanctification. And one day we will be saved even from the presence of sin in glorification. So we're justified and we're saved. We continue to be sanctified throughout the Christian life. And one day we'll be glorified in heaven. So in, in emphasize, if you're a Christian alive on this earth right now, you're in this process called sanctification. And it is a process. I would really emphasize that. Sanctification is gradual growth in holiness. Listen, some of your class members really need to hear this because they, they get discouraged. They, they, they think, you know, if I'm a Christian, why do I still sin? Why do I have these bad thoughts? Well, why do I still worry? Why do, why do I have such a bad temper? Am I not a Christian? But they need to understand they are in this process of sanctification. They're not perfect yet. And, and that's, that's normal. The sanctification is a process that takes time. This could really be encouraging to some of your people. Sanctification is a process. They're in the process if they've been saved and growing spiritually. But it's a process. It takes time. I like to say that sanctification or holiness is like getting a tan. You don't get a good tan in one day. You can get burnt in a day. You can't get a good tan in one day. You get a tan gradually, one day at a time, as you add to it. And that's how it is with holiness, too. You don't get holy overnight. You get holy gradually, one day at a time. Many of us know John Newton as the former slave trader and the author of a great song, Amazing Grace, but he also had a widespread ministry of counseling in England through letter writing. To one uh, uh, friend, he wrote, you must not expect habits and tempers will be eradicated instantaneously, but by perseverance in prayer and observation upon the experiences of every day, much may be done in time. Newton wrote, now and then you will, as usual in the course of war, lose a battle, but be not discouraged. Rally your forces and return to the fight. Newton was emphasizing to his friend, listen, listen you're, you're going to lose some battles spiritually, but, but give it time. You're going to grow. You're going you're gonna to be more holy over time. But he emphasizes the process, and it's going to take some time. And, and this kind of hits at one of the problems that a lot of people have in the Christian life, that many people are looking for one experience that will magically make them holy at once, uh, whether they call it getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit or having a revival or going on some retreat week, or weekend or, or whatever. They're looking for some event. They're looking for some seminar, or some experience that's going to suddenly make them a mature, holy Christian. Uh, as Americans in this microwave computer generation, we're especially susceptible to this. We're always looking for something to make us holy all at once. We're looking for the shortcuts. And the problem with that is you can't become spiritually mature overnight. You are not going to become holy all at once. It's a process. A.W. Tozer uh, wrote, no shortcut exists. 
God has not bowed to our nervous haste nor embraced the methods of our machine age. It is well that we accept the hard truth now. The man who would know God must give time to him. He must count no time wasted which is spent in the cultivation of his acquaintance. He must give himself to meditation and prayer hours on end. So did the saints of old. So did the glorious company of the apostles, the goodly fellowship of the prophets, and the believing members of the holy church in all generations. That's from A.W. Tozer, T-O-Z-E-R, in his book, God's Pursuit of Man. But what he's saying there is you can't microwave holiness. You're not going to get it all at once, not through any experience, not through any event. It is a process that's going to take as long as you live, and even to your last day here on earth, you're not going to get it perfectly. But the balance we're talking about here is don't give up. Never stop shooting for it. You're never going to have it here on earth, but don't give up. Keep pressing forward for sanctification. So, so chapter 4 opens by talking about sanctification or holiness in general, and then it gets into some specifics regarding holiness. Starting in verses 3 and 4, he says uh, you need to uh, abstain from sexual immorality, uh, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in, in sanctification and honor. The word uh, translated sexual immorality here is a Greek word pornea. Of course, we get our word pornography from. It's a very general uh, word that refers to all kinds of immorality, any kind of sexuality expressed outside of, of the will of God, outside of God's word, outside of the bonds of marriage, it means promiscuity among unmarried individuals, it means adultery in married people, it means pornography, it means homosexuality, any kind of sexual behavior outside of biblical boundaries. Of course, this is huge in our society today, and it's been infecting and, and creeping in even to the church. A lot of people think they can be good Christians and ignore what God says about sexual morality. And, and you cannot do that. You can't be a good Christian and, and live uh, uh, with somebody in immorality outside of marriage. You can't be a good Christian and leave your spouse to someone else that you happen to be attracted to. You can't be a good Christian and use pornography. You can't be a good Christian and practice homosexuality. You can't be a good Christian and reject the gender that God purposefully gave you when you were born. It's significant that as the Bible talks about sanctification here, the first command he gives, the first thing that he mentions is regarding sexuality. It's because it is vital to our relationship with God. If we're going to be holy before God, we must be holy in regard to sexuality. It's not a small thing. It cannot be ignored for anyone who genuinely wants to walk with God. Then verse 6 says, By the way, the Lord is the avenger in these things. He will not leave it unpunished. Verse 7, we see that word sanctification again. Then he mentions another important element of our, our holiness. And that is the love of the brethren. And he says again in verse 10, excel still more. He says, you, you are loving each other. But he said, don't be satisfied where you are. Again, in, in regard to loving each other, he says, keep growing in love for each other. Now, at this point in your class, you, you could talk about your church. You know, what are some good ways that, that we in our church are, are, are doing a good job of loving each other? For example, in our church, First Baptist Angleton, we could say our people are really doing some things well. Our deacons are making visits to homebound, uh, taking people to doctor's appointments, sitting with husbands who have Alzheimer's. Our ladies are making meals for those who've had surgeries and, and so on. They're really doing well at these things. I think Paul could have written this verse to our church, and, and maybe you could say the same thing about your church. But he, but he says you're doing good on loving each other, but he says excel still more. Don't be content with what you're doing. Push it on to the next level. Excel still more in love for each other. So you might talk with your class at this point. What can we do to love each other even more as, a, as individuals, as a class? How, how can we minister to our class members or prospects or homebound or needy or children or youth in the church? What would God have us do to excel still more in love? So you can have some good application here to, to really do something with your class, encourage people to make some specific application to excel still more in love, like Paul says here. In verses 11, 12, uh, lists some more ways that we can grow in holiness. And they might not be what you think about first when you think about holiness. He says, lead a quiet life. Attend your own business. In other words, don't be a busybody. Work with your hands. Be, behave properly toward outsiders and not have any need. And so he's kind of talking here about this idea of working. 
uh, evidently they had a problem with it here in the Thessalonians. Paul kind of gently introduces it here in, in 1 Thessalonians. But then in 2 Thessalonians, he repeats it again, if you look over there in chapter 3, but he repeats it even stronger. He says, if anyone will not work, neither let him eat. So he's saying, listen, part of your sanctification, keeping from sin, is not to be lazy. Work. Uh, something to this idea of working is becoming an issue today, isn't it? With a lot of businesses having difficulty hiring and keeping people. I've heard several businessmen say, people don't want to work. But as Christians, part of our holiness is being committed to work. Don't be lazy, he says, but work. Now, so these things I just mentioned, Paul was saying, these are some of the specific things the Thessalonians needed to do to be more holy. That's their application. And some of it may apply to you and to your group. But what I want you to think of, there, there might be other applications you need to make. What are the temptations of your class? What, what are the people in your town being tempted by? What, what does your group need to do to be more holy? And you could even open it up to the class and, and talk about it. And what areas of life do people like us here where we are, what do we need to do to be more holy? Maybe it's our words. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's substance abuse. Maybe it's TV, internet, pornography, whatever. Talk about it with your group. Get, get their thoughts. What do we need to do to grow in holiness? What, what areas do, do, do we need to be more holy before God? You know, as we look at the problems facing our country today, many of us think of, of God's great promise in 2 Chronicles uh, seven fourteen. If my people who are called by my name, of course, that key phrase, will turn from their wicked ways. So this is a key. If we want God's blessing, if we want to see our country turn around, we have got to turn from our wicked ways. So we need to pinpoint what are some of our wicked ways that we need to turn from. Talk about this in your class. And you might have a silent time of confession or, or whatever, but in some way, lead your class to be confronted and, and confess sins and seek God's forgiveness and grace to change. We're not perfect. We're never going to be perfect until we get to glory. But we've got to keep that tension we see here in this passage. Don't be content where we are, but keep trying to excel still more and grow in holiness till the day the Lord brings us home. Then next week, we're going to talk about his bringing us home as we look to his return in chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. All right. Well, as always, if you'll post something in the comments, I'll make a point to pray for you this Saturday or Sunday. God bless you as you share your his word with your group this week. Again, if you'd like to hear just a minute or two about my Bulgaria trip, hang on for another minute. If not, then I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. I did want to say uh, in regards to the Bulgaria report, I had a number of you indicate in the comments that you're praying uh, for me last week, and I, I appreciate it so much. The, the trip was amazing. Had the opportunity to share uh, in, the, in the 10 days of the trip, I shared evangelism training with some pastors of churches in, in Sofia, Bulgaria. We went to a town where our association has led in planning a small mission church. I was able to preach to them and, and share the gospel. There were several uh, lost people present that morning who got to hear the gospel, including at least one Muslim man. We went up high in the icy mountains to continue building relationships with some folks up there. I was able to share the story of the prodigal son with someone. After I, after I told, I said, have you ever heard that story? They said, I've never heard that. It was amazing. The first time someone ever heard the story of the prodigal son. What an amazing privilege to be able to share that. Then there's another small town we're seeking to begin a mission in and as a, a Muslim village. And we found by God's providence in an amazing, I don't have time to go into it right now, but he, he showed us there was one Christian man in this town and, and he wants to be used to, to help reach Muslims in that town. So we encouraged him, worshiped with him, had the Lord's Supper with him. He said, I haven't had that for years being here by myself. So we're gonna be working with him in the future, a, a key man of peace, a key contact. So those are some of the ministry highlights. It was an amazing trip. Then the last day was a tour day. We went in the city of Philippi, uh, which is not far from, from there. It was amazing. I got to touch what they believe is the prison where Paul and Silas sang and shared, believe on the Lord Jesus and, and you'll be saved. I got to walk on the Via Ignatia where Paul cast the demon out of the young girl on the very same street. And they're still uncovering portions of it there. They're working on it as we were there. But it was amazing. I went down in the, the icy cold river where Lydia was baptized. I said, I've got to get in. It was, it was freezing cold. But I had to get in. I, I couldn't pass it up and I just wade around in there and act like I was baptizing somebody. Did have some difficulty getting back. My flight from Sofia, Bulgaria to Istanbul was canceled. I wanted to get back to, to our church for Sunday, so I took an overnight bus 
from Sofia, Bulgaria to Istanbul, Turkey, not knowing any Bulgarian or Turkish. Uh, I, again, long story short, it got a little bit hairy there for a while, getting stopped at the Turkish border, couldn't speak the language. The bottom line is God, God got me home, and it was a, a sweet reunion for our church. So thank you for being part of the prayers that brought me home. I whisper another prayer, if you would, right now for those folks in Bulgaria, that God's Spirit would move there in a powerful way. Thank you for praying with me, and know that I'll be praying with you this Sunday too.